All right, thanks to everyone who stuck around for the second service. Um, so today, uh, I'm preaching a sermon called Shame and Judgment. Um, now, it began as just a study on shame um, and, and what it says in the Bible, but it actually quickly became apparent there are other things that are tied to shame as well, um, which I hadn't considered, but today we're going to be exploring some of what they are. Um, so I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 59. So in Isaiah 59, beginning of verse 4, it says, None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are always of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. And down to verse 14, it says, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. So these are people who are trying to do what's right, but then they're attacked for it by the people who are not doing right. It says, And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. So this chapter paints a great picture on where the lack of judgment can actually lead to shame. It lists some of the shameful acts of the people, how they always sought after wickedness, but it says the Lord also hates when there is no judgment. And shame comes when we forsake the Lord's judgments. So if you want to turn to Isaiah 61, verse 8, just over the page, the Lord says, For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I'll direct their work in truth, and I'll make an everlasting covenant with them. So God loves judgment, but he hates when there's no judgment. And we'll see that correlation in a moment. If you want to turn to Psalm 119, uh, Psalm 119, verse 5, and I'll read to you from Amos chapter 5, verse 15. It says, Hate the evil and love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So you need to have both love and hate in your life to judge righteously. You know, so you need to love God and the things of God, but you need to hate sin and every evil way, especially the way of the world. And this is who God is, and that's how we should be too. We should have love and we should have hate. And if you have one but without the other, then you don't have, you know, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is love and hate. He hates sin, but he loves, you know, he loves righteousness and he loves judgment and justice. So in Psalm 119, verse 5, it says, O oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes, then shall I not be ashamed, when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. So we see that here that, you know, they're not ashamed because they keep the statutes of the Lord and they love the righteous judgments of the Lord. And that's how we can make sure that we're not ashamed by loving the righteous judgments of the Lord. And we can see how the righteous judgments of God are a part of not being ashamed. It's a theme that you'll actually find through all the scriptures. I was, it just fascinated me when I was studying this how much I actually saw this throughout all the Old Testament and New Testament books. You know, so when, when it comes to Christ, as Christians, we're to suffer you know, shame for his name's sake. But in regard to how the world, that, and that's in regard to how the world views us, but we're not to, su to, to suffer shame unto God. Uh, and that's when we, we suffer shame unto God, when we break his commandments, when we don't love his statutes, when we don't love his laws and doctrines. So I'll get you to turn to Judges chapter 18. 
So all that before was just the basis for what we need to understand what shame is and how judgment plays a big role in that. And as I said, we do see that a lot in the Old and New Testament. But in Judges chapter 18, verse 1, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for under that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And just go down to verse 7. It says, Then the five men departed and came to Laish, and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything, and they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. So it says there was no magistrate to bring shame to the people, and that's something a magistrate will do, a judge, a magistrate, a king, a preacher, a prophet. That's their role, is to bring shame to the people for the sins they commit. And it says in Isaiah 58 verse 1, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. So again, as preachers especially, we need to bring back shaming those shameful things. You know, bring back shaming the whoredoms, the whores and whoremongers. You know, we should be shaming nakedness. We should be shaming the feminine men and masculine women. And, you know, these are things the Lord hates that have no place in our lives or in the church. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Actually, you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 3, 23. I'll read to you from Jeremiah 2, 26. It says, As a thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed, they, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. So when a nation's wicked, everyone, including the kings and princes, are brought to shame. So Jeremiah 3.23, it says, Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. So if you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, but that's why the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Obeying God's laws and listening to his statutes and obeying the voice of the Lord is better for God than any sacrifice you can do. So in Jeremiah 6.14, it says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them, and shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. So these people, they wouldn't hearken to the word of God, not even to the watchman which he placed over them. And that's like a preacher getting up to preach the word of God, and he might touch on something that you're finding you're struggling with. But you've got two choices. You know, you can either harden yourself and not receive correction, or you can humble yourself and feel the shame and go to God and repent. You know, so we should feel that shame and repentance at the hearing of God's word when it testifies against us. So don't harden your heart to sin. Uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12. It should just be a page or two over. In Jeremiah 8, verse 12, it says again, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. And there shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. So God hates when we don't judge ourselves or our sins. 
You know, when the leaders are gone and there's no one to do the judging, that's when you're going to find that sin and chaos enters into especially a church. And with our pastor not here full time like he was, you know, we still need to consider that we preach the whole counsel of God and bring to remembrance, you know, and show the people their sins. You know, and I don't mean to go up to someone and point out their sins to them, you know, or point out other people's sins, you know, talking ill of other people. But if it's worthy of church discipline, then that's something you report to Pastor Kevin and he will deal with it accordingly. And if it's not worthy of church discipline, then you just need to keep it to yourself and let God deal with that person. You know, but it's through the preaching that we open the word and we, we you know, proclaim people's sins. And then if it hits you, then you need to deal with that privately with the Lord. And that's, that's what I'm going to try and aim to do today, at least somewhat. Um, but in regards to judgment, there has to be leadership to execute judgment. That's why we have Pastor Kevin. We would go to him for, for certain church matters. Um, so I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But I'll read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 14. And it says, So David reigned over all Israel and executed judgment and justice among all his people. And in 2 Chronicles 9, 8, it says, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on this throne, to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore he made thee king over them to do judgment and justice. So we see consistently when there's no judge or king in the land, all through the book of Judges, you see that everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And it was, what's right in their eyes is all manner of wickedness. It was never anything good. It was always wickedness. There was always sodomites in the land. There was always a problem in the land when everyone did what was right. When the judge came in, they, they put the hammer down and they stamped a lot of that out. That's why we need judges. But we should also judge ourselves. And also, you know, within the church, we need to judge. And I'll get to that in a minute. But there wasn't anybody to bring shame upon the people for their sins. You know, so you need to bring shame for the whoredoms and the idolatry, you know, and all the other things that will creep in, especially to a church. And as New Testament kings and priests, we are actually commanded to judge. And we are able to make righteous judgments because we are kings and priests and we have the mind of Christ. We have his word. Now, David was appointed as king for this purpose. And with Abraham, remember, there were 70 elders as well. You know, so Moses was the judge, but he couldn't keep up with everything. So for the smaller matters, they had 70 additional elders who would help him to make day-to-day -day judgments. And, you know, that's why they're appointed. You need to have leaders and, and elders, people who, you know, do understand the word and law of God, who are actually able to judge righteously. And we don't judge according to the flesh or the old carnal man based on appearances, but we to judge the spiritual matters according to the law of God, you know. And that's why we have that command in the New Testament. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So look at verse number 1. It says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? The Bible says we're going to judge the world then, you know, it says, of course, we're worthy to judge even the small matters within the church, you know, amongst the brethren, between each other. You know, so we, could, we are commanded here to judge, even those small things. Now, know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If ye then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So, and that would be pretty sad if you don't have one righteous man in a church who can't judge between his brethren. But this is in context of going to the world for judgment instead of going to God's people because even the least esteemed in the church can judge better than anyone in the world because we have the Spirit of God and the mind of Christ. And that, but judgment is something we're commanded to do and it's such an important thing to do. And it's a shame if you don't judge. And it, it's even more of a shame if a church doesn't practice judgment because that's a church that's going to be full of idolatry, fornication, adultery. It's going to, going to be full of all these things, all manner of wickedness. So we have to judge. And that's why I read Matthew 7 earlier, Matthew 7 and 18, they give examples of how we judge certain matters. And I say we don't judge in hypocrisy. 
Um, we don't. We need to give our brother time to repent one on one. You know, and if if the brother won't repent after you've gone one on one, then it goes before other witnesses, and then it goes before the church. You know, there's there's an order to things, and God lays that out. But He wouldn't give us that order if there was no command to judge. And the purpose of church discipline is to actually shame somebody into repentance. That's the whole point. We'll see it in 1 Corinthians 5, if you want to turn there. And there is a conclusion of that matter in 2 Corinthians 2. The man committing adultery was cast out and repented. He returned and was forgiven. And that's the correct church discipline. That's correct judgment. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, this is the Apostle Paul says, For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when he had gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now that's an interesting point. You now he says, When you gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, that's why you have to be saved, you know, to, to actually judge righteously. The world will never judge righteously. They haven't got the Spirit of God. They haven't got the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're commanded to judge as a church. Because we have that. We can judge righteous judgment. Um, and if you just want to go down to 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, it says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth, Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So that point of judging within the church, again, is to cause repentance to the sinner and for them to return. So you need forgiveness to take place and restoration of the person that was cast out. Otherwise, the whole church will actually be judged if you allow that person to stay. You know, there's clear, it's clear on that too. I'll get you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. And we see, uh, so yeah, we see that with the letters to the churches in Revelation. Uh, the one we're going to look at is in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 2, is the church in Pergamos. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So, and in Peter it says, judgment begins at the house of God. If we don't judge in ourselves and within the church, we can bring shame upon ourselves and upon of the church before God. But not only shame, but it can actually induce the wrath of God. And God may punish the church for allowing these wicked, this wickedness to continue without practicing church discipline. You know, it says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So you need to cast that wicked person out so that they're judged of God outside and the church will be spared. Um, and if they repent and return, then neither they, neither they nor the church will be judged by God because God accepts the judgment of the church. It says, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's in regards to the judgment and church discipline. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll get you to turn to Ezra chapter 9. But your conscience toward God should cause you to feel shame when you sin against the Lord. Shame will lead you to your personal repentance in your walk, or at least it should. And repentance is something we do daily. Not obviously not for salvation, we all understand that here. But repentance is how you keep a clear account with God. So Ezra chapter 9 covers that shame. And I'll just read to you from Proverbs 28, 7. It says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. And I mean, how much would you want that said of God the Father? You know, he is our Father. And if we're running with right as men, committing all kinds of wickedness, then we're going to bring shame to him as well and to his name. And that's not someone who we want to be. So in Ezra chapter 9, uh, Ezra, yeah, Ezra chapter 9 verse 1, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel 
and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that they eat the holy, so that the holy seed hath mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. So God gave a commandment, the people of Levi and the priests were to be set apart. That was, that was God's inheritance. That was the tithe of the children of Israel that was given to God. And these people were never meant to marry outside of, outside of the Levites. You know, and they were taking wives of other, other nations and committing all manner of wickedness. But it says that the, these bad leaders, these princes and rulers, they were causing others to sin. They weren't judging as they should. But rather, with no judgment, they were letting these things go on. In Ezra 9, verse 3, it says, And when I heard this thing, this is, this is Ezra, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgressions of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished unto the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up under the heavens. Now you look at this response and you compare that to the response in Jeremiah 6, where it said they could not blush, you know, and they certainly had hardened themselves against sin. Whereas Ezra here had the correct response. You know, in Jeremiah they had no shame. They had no conscience toward God and their sin. Whereas Ezra, you saw he rent his garment and he bowed his face. He was unable to lift his face off the ground out of the shame he had for the people of Israel and their sins. And this is how we should be personally with our own sins, but also in the way of interceding, you know, sometimes for the sins of the nation or the sins of other people. Um, because this is what Ezra is doing. He's, he's not the one committing the sins, but he's interceding on behalf of the people before God. And, you know, he's ashamed of that sin. And that is a sign of a great leader and a great preacher. And Moses, you saw, was also like that. He interceded many times for the people and their sins, standing between them and God. So all that being said, we, you know, we now understand how judgment will tie in with the shame of the people. And I just want to mention for the sake of time that all sin is shameful. Every transgression of the law is shameful and will bring shame to you and to God and will cause his word and doctrine to be blasphemed. But there are some sins which are specifically associated with shame, so I'm going to go through some of those now. Um, I'll get you to turn to Exodus chapter 32, verse 24. But we'll go for the low-hanging fruit, and that's nakedness. And nakedness is defined as having your thighs and or your buttocks uncovered. So we're to wear clothing long enough, men and women, to cover your secret parts and your thighs down to at least the top of your knee is where the Bible describes that. In Exodus 28, 42, it says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches, that's pants, to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And this is, of course, in regards to the priests. But when Moses went up the mountain to receive the commandments from the Lord, Aaron made the people of Israel naked to their shame. So we'll pick up that story in verse 24, Exodus 32. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among the enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from, the gate, from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor, and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now that's one of the harsher examples of that, 
But there were many things that they should be ashamed of here. There was idolatry with the golden calf. There was nakedness. There was fornication. And all of this while God is speaking with Moses to give these people the law. You know, the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments that were given to him when he was up the mountain. And while it is a severe punishment, it was necessary. Because God hates when we do do those things that are shameful, but more so when we feel no remorse. When we are completely unrepentant, that's when God's going to come down and chastise you even harder. And so, if you know, for your own sake, definitely consider judging yourself and repenting, you know, as often as you need to. Because God hates when we make excuse for our sins, and we see Aaron here is just making an excuse for making an idol, making an excuse for, for the people being naked and fornicating. You know, sometimes you just got to take ownership and receive the chastisement that's coming for you. And God might show mercy, he might not. But you just need to take it on the chin. Because at the end of the day, it was you who broke his law. So, and the lazy are another people that also ought to feel shame. The Bible says, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. It's shameful not to provide for your family or to be too lazy to provide for yourself. Proverbs 10.15 says, The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life. The fruit of the wicked to sin. So another one is uh, reproving a scorner. And this would be wasting your time with a heretic after you've admonished him. uh, Or just somebody who scorns and mocks at the word of God. And the things of God. Proverbs 9, 7 says, He that reproveth the scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh the wicked man getteth himself a blot. Sometimes it's just not worth arguing with people. You know, they've made their choice, and if, if you rebuke them and they double down, you know what, just don't waste your time. You know, because it's only you who's going to bring shame and foolishness to yourself. Um, so pride is another one. Brother Sam brought that up this morning. Um, but pride and refusing correction are a shame unto the Lord. Proverbs thirteen eighteen says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honoured. And verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 12 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. So if you want it to be said that you're wise, then pride is not something you can show, because pride only brings you shame. And it makes people think you're a fool. Now, of course, you've got graven images uh, and idols. I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 44. So we'll look at graven images and idols, but we just heard before about with Aaron as well. This is something that brought shame to Israel. And I'll read to you from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16. It says, And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. And you're there in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 8. It says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of whom vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a God or molten graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen. They are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. So again, you know, when you worship a God, any, you know, any kind of graven image or anything like that, that's not, you know, like we have a living God. God is not made of an object of gold, silver, or even carved wood. You know, like there's, there's are all vanity. You know, that Buddha statue, that Hindu statue, whatever they've got. It's all vanity, you know, and God just says, let them be ashamed because that is shameful to worship a a God that can do nothing, a dead God, a piece of wood. (laughs) So whores and whoremongers, of course, the next one. 
Uh, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4 says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. In Proverbs 23, 27 says, For a whore is as a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in waiters for a prey, and increases the transgressors among men. Uh, now, I mean, being a whore used to be one of the most shameful things a woman could do. Seems like it's glorified these days where, you know, it, it's just insanity what this world is coming up with. But we should still be shaming these things. This is what God shames. This is what we should shame. You know, we stand with God. We don't change with the times. We stand with the Word of God. Now, Leviticus 19.29, this is, uh, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. And there was a commandment also for the priests not to take wives of whores, you know, because the Levitical priests, as I said, were set apart to be separated by God. They were not to take a whore as a wife. Um, so you've got men and women's clothing, uh, women wearing that which pertaineth unto a man. Both of these are shameful. Again, we live in a world where this is normal. In Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, we're all familiar with this, but the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So again, be careful with what you wear. You know, God's very clear about what his standards are. Another thing that we find ourselves getting into trouble with, being busybodies. And that's when you involve yourself in someone else's business uh, that's not your own, and you just gossip about those people as well, behind their back. It applies to men and women, but of course women, it's something they're probably more susceptible to. But it does happen even in the workplace between men. It should never be that way for us. Uh, but I'll just read to you from 1 Timothy 15, verse 11. It says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they shall marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also on busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So again, being busybodies, whether you're a man or woman, it brings shame to you and to God. Um, another one that's covered in the New Testament, you know, men having long hair and women having short hair. I won't read it to you, but 1 Corinthians 11, if you want to read that for yourself. Um, another one is men not leading their home, not providing for their household as is commanded, or even effeminate weak men who can't rule over their own house, who have no control over, the, you know, over their wife, and their wife doesn't submit to them. You know, men are commanded to be strong. The Bible says, quit you like men, be strong. That's a commandment. God wants us to be strong men, men who can stand up against this world and can rule their house, can rule their families. And of course, a pastor who can rule a church, he also must be strong. Like if you ever want to be a pastor someday, you've got to be a strong-willed man. You know, and you've got to be strong in the Lord spiritually and also emotionally and physically. Um, so, and... Another shame is women who rule over men, women who usurp authority over the men. It actually destroys nations. We can not only see that today, but if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. So in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, it says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, and the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Now you only need to look at the world today to see what feminism's done to this world. You know, you've got women who are whoredoms are through the roof. Abortions, murder is through the roof. You know, of course you've got your bleeding hearts where they're just handing out money and to, to anyone who'll have it, you know. It's just, that's not what God wanted. God said, look, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Right. He didn't say you should get a handout just because, you know, we want you to have one. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's by allowing women to rule that this has caused this problem. 
Now, another one is disobedience. Not just disobedience to God, of course, that brings shame. Um, but wives disobeying their husbands. If you want to read through Titus chapter 2, you've got children disobeying their parents. You'll find that in Ephesians 6, verse 1, and Proverbs 29, 15. Men disobeying their masters or their boss at work. You'll find in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But all of these will cause the word of, and the doctrine of God to be blasphemed. That's something that comes up between the both of them, is when you disobey your boss at work, he gives you an instruction and you backbite or whatever, you don't do it. You know, it actually causes them to look at you and say, well, you're a Christian, I'm not going to hire any more Christians because if they're all like you, I don't want to know them. And the word of God is blasphemed in the world today. People hate us, not because we stand for the truth, but they hate the hypocrites. They hate the ones who go out there and who will not obey their husbands, who will not, children who don't obey their parents and people who don't obey their bosses. You know, we need to cause the word of God to be glorified through us. And we do that by being obedient as God has commanded us. Because at the end of the day, Christ is our boss. If you're going to work, you're not working for the council or you're not working for the, the government or you're not working for your boss, you're working for Christ. So if you're working poorly or backbiting your earthly boss, then like Christ is ashamed. And again, that's not something we should, something we should do. The Bible makes that clear that in every stage we should obey the pastor, we should obey our parents, we should obey... You know, you should obey your husband, you should obey your boss. Now, uh, again, preachers, they should be ashamed if they hold back on doctrine. Perhaps they don't like that doctrine or they, you know, just find it hard to preach on. But you shouldn't be teaching any doctrine that you haven't studied for yourself. And a great example of that we find, especially in the Baptist world, is the pre-trib rapture. There are so many who preach it who just haven't done their, their own study. They haven't done their due diligence. They're just listening to some, someone else come in, tell them, you know, like, oh, yeah, I believe that. But then when you actually question them on it, they have no answer. You know, you can show them scriptures. They have no answer because they just show their ignorance. You know, in which case they should never teach it and they should never allow it to be taught in their church. But it's also shameful for them not to teach on it because it's a big part of scripture. So, you know, for every lazy preacher out there who doesn't, you know, who, who doesn't understand such a basic doctrine, but a fundamental doctrine, you know, shame on them. But where, where do you think heresy comes from? It's not always from those unsaved wolves, those false prophets, but quite often it's just from lazy, lazy teachers. You know, sometimes a novice who has no place behind a pulpit so if you don't study yourself before you preach, you ought to be ashamed. So if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. It says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was give it, given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Like, how are you going to teach other people when you haven't even taught yourself? You know, when you haven't even gone through and studied the Bible. That's the problem with a lot of preachers today. They might recycle their sermons because they've only studied a little bit of the Bible. That's what they know. But shame on them for not knowing more. Oh, at least we're in a church here where all the men here, I can say, they, they know more than a lot of the pastors I know out there because they read their Bible, they study their Bible, and they love the Word of God. It's amazing how much you can tell about a person by how much they understand the Bible. So to 2 Timothy verse, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned under fables. But watch thou in all things, 
endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Um, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, just back over a page. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for a proof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, that's why God's left us with his law. That's why he's given us his word of God. That's why he's given us his statutes and commandments, because he wants the preacher to get up and expound them all. doesn't matter if it's popular. doesn't matter who wants to hear it. Look, you've got to cover the whole book. If you only know half the book, then you've failed as a preacher. You've failed as a teacher. You need to know the whole Bible, and you need to be able to preach it. Otherwise, you've got no place behind a pulpit. And I'll read to you from Mark 8, 38. It says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now that's why I don't want to hold back on any preaching. You know, just because I might find it difficult or unpleasant, I'm going to preach the word, you know, regardless of what it says. You know, because I don't want the Lord to be ashamed of me because I'm not ashamed of him. I'm not ashamed of what his word says. So I'm not ashamed to preach whatever the Bible says, popular or unpopular. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm 69. So we've covered a lot of bad types of shame, but of course all sin is shameful. But now we're going to look at one good type of shame. And this is that type of shame is to be reproached or shame for the cause of Christ. So this is when someone attacks you for living a holy and separated life. You know, when they attack you for preaching the gospel and speaking the truth. So when they attack the Lord and blaspheme his name because they hate righteousness and your clean living, you know, this is the shame you should wear with honour. This is something we're actually called to do as believers. And we saw that back in Isaiah 59, 15. It says, He that, that departeth from evil making himself, makes himself a prey. So yeah, you're going to be a victim sometimes to the wicked world because you're living right. They're going to hate you because you make them look bad. But we just do what we've got to do because that's what God commanded us to do. So in Psalm 69 verse 5, it says, O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from me. That, that alone is a scary thought. Everything we do, every thought we have, every, every you know, God knows our sins are not hid from him. You know, you're not fooling anybody by trying to hide your sins. You might fool the world, you might fool your family, but you're not going to fool God. Anyway, so 69 verse 6, let, them not, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel, because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Go down to verse 19. It says, Thou hast known my reproach, and my shame, and my dishonour. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now that should be pretty familiar to anyone who's read the New Testament. You know, this psalm's describing that crucifixion and suffering of Christ on the cross. But that's the shame and pain that he bare, but he also wants us to share in his pain and shame as Christians. And it says, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Hebrews, I'll get you to turn to he, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now in Galatians 6, 17, uh, Paul writes this, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now Paul was beaten with many stripes. 
you know, many times for preaching Christ's resurrection. He was thrown in prison, he was beaten, he was stoned even to death. You know, by some miracle he didn't die. But they left him for dead because they hated the message. And all he was preaching was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what, you know, what this church does when they go door to door and when they witness to people, they're preaching the resurrection of Christ. People are going to want to kill you for that. That's the reality. But God expects us to suffer persecution. And he'll, like, he'll protect us. In many times he'll protect us. But again, we can't guarantee that. You have to be willing to lay down your life even for him. So you'll be there in 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 12. It says, Beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a, or as a busy, busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? So again, Christ just makes it clear. While he despised the shame, he was looking forward to the glory. He says we also can despise the shame of being reproached for his name's sake, but look forward to the glory to come. So if your heart's set on the things of God, then you're going to rejoice when the persecution comes. You know, rather than sort of have self-pity and whatever you might feel because someone wants to hurt you for the cause of Christ, it's like, well, look, for every stripe they give you, that's rewards in heaven. So glory in that. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 5, we see another example here of the apostles in Acts chapter 5, verse 40. It says, And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And of course, there's that famous verse in Romans 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now imagine if the Apostle Paul had been ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How, much, how little would we have if he was ashamed? Like, when we're ashamed of the gospel of Christ, you know, that affects this world. When we're not bold enough to open our mouth and preach the gospel, because we're afraid of what, what might happen or what they might think. You know, not willing to take the persecution that those before us, you know, have taken great persecution. Persecution that we've just never seen. And yet we're even too ashamed to just open our mouth and preach the gospel. Another thing Paul brings up is not ashamed of our brother in bonds, in prison. So Paul spoke of when he was in prison, there were some that were offended at him, but there were some that also came and visited him and were a blessing unto him. So we should visit our brethren when they're in hospital, in prison, or when they're being persecuted. You know, we shouldn't be ashamed of them, but we should stand with them. And we should do that publicly as well. Because in the garden, you saw the, you know, the disciples, they were scattered and offended and ashamed. Peter denied Christ three times, even to a little girl. You know, and we shouldn't be like that. We should have boldness. Um, you know, if you've got the Spirit of God, you do have boldness. Um, and Christ says, Whosoever will confess me before men, him also shall I confess before my Father in heaven. I mean, don't you want that? Do you want Christ to deny you in heaven because you, you know, are not bold enough to actually acknowledge him? So uh, I'll read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul writes, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So again, as several of us have preached over the last month or two, you know, we're running a race. And if you finish the course, as Paul did, and you keep the faith to the end, it says you'll have no shame. If you drop out of the race, 
then when you stand before Christ, you're going to be ashamed. You didn't make it to the end. You know, you quit when you should have kept going. Now, we should never stop working for the Lord. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, it says that now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I mean, I hope, I'm <laughs> I hope that's me. I really hope that's me at the end. I can say, you know what, I made it to the end and I have no, I'm not ashamed, you know, because I served God to the very end. Like, as Brother Sam preached this morning, like Moses did his best works after 80. Like, you know, he made it to the end. And, you know, we should aim for the same thing. So this is going to leave us with that final and ultimate shame, and that's the shame of eternal damnation. So I'll get you to turn to Isaiah, chap Isaiah chapter 66. That's the last I'll have you to turn to. But in Daniel 12, verse 2, it says that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, we're, we're never going to face that shame because we're already saved. So we are going to raise up into everlasting life, to everlasting salvation. And th so that, that everlasting contempt and shame is that great white throne judgment. You know, that's why in Hebrews 9 verse 27, it says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. So that's the judgment that the unsaved, the dead, are going to stand before. And they're going to be ashamed. They won't even, they'll, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's when that's going to happen. They're going to be ashamed and they're going to glorify God. But they're still going to be cast into the lake of fire. In Romans 3.33 it says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offence. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And that's us. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In Isaiah 45, 17, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without him. So you see a big difference there between those who are going to be ashamed on that day and those who aren't. And so look down at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. And it says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For the, all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb is as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offer, offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. So again, your enemies are going to be ashamed. But you, if you stand by the word of God, and they cast you out for the Lord's name's sake, said, then the Lord will be glorified and he'll appear to our joy. That's what we have to look forward to. So what's important to God is that we love him and his word and we give heed to his commandments and statutes. We need to have a poor and contrite spirit, not proud or haughty, and we receive correction and feel shame for our sins. We repent daily to the Lord, keep that clear account, not building up wrath or anger or hardening our hearts to sin. So how can we help others to avoid shame? So firstly, to those that are saved, we preach judgment and righteousness. You know, because if you love the Lord's statutes, you keep his statutes, then it says you won't, you won't have shame. But every time we break his statutes, of course, we have shame. But we have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who he says will intercede on our behalf. 
will forgive us of all our sins. If we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So that's what we can do. We can repent when we understand. We hear that righteous preaching on justice and righteousness. And for those who are not saved, of course we preach judgment and righteousness, but we preach Christ crucified as we try to win their souls. You know, so don't forget judgment. It's not just in your own life, your own sins. But remember that the, the unjust, the unsaved, they will also be judged and cast into hell. So we need to save what we can. So we'll just close there and we'll pray.